Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President of Communications and Policy Outreach here at the Centre. Thank you for joining us uh, today for this event entitled Turning Trash into Social Value. Uh, we've got a few examples of exactly how that's done physically out back. I hope you've had a chance to look at them. But first of all, let me welcome everybody in the room and also those of you who are watching on our live stream. It's great for you. To, uh, we're very happy that you could join us. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping points before we start. Uh, I'm going to invite you to silence your phones, but keep hold of them because we'd love for you to live tweet the event using our hashtag, hashtag CGD Talks. Um, and then we'll also hopefully be taking questions from people watching on the live stream via that hashtag on Twitter. If you want to ask a question later on, then please tweet. I'll be keeping an eye on that uh, throughout the uh, event. And of course, yeah, there will be time for questions uh, built into the event, which will finish at 11.30. So today we're going to learn about Gitanjali, which is a woman's collective that literally turns trash into social value. We're going to learn about why this cooperative has been impactful, what it needs to be to be even more successful, and what generalizable lessons that uh, we can take away that could help other similar enterprises. Remember that Gitanjali Cooperative is an exception rather than the rule. Uh, it employs 50 women, but millions of women in Asia particularly work in the informal sector in dangerous, back-breaking conditions for very little pay and with no security. So another key question today is whether and how this social enterprise model could be a viable path for other women uh, into better, more empowered work? And if so, how do we actually make that happen? Those are some of the questions that we're going to be putting to our expert panel. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll learn more about the cooperative from CGD senior fellow Myra Buvenich, uh, and then we'll bring up our panel for our discussion. But first, let's learn a little bit about SEWA, which is the Self-Employed Women's Association, and they launched Gitanjali. And we're going to play you now a short video from Rima Nanavati, who is their CEO. Namaste. Um, a very uh, warm greetings from SEVA, um, the Self-Employed Women's Association. Um, we organize the women workers in the informal economy in our country. Um, today we have a membership of around 1.5 million members in India alone. Um, we come together at SEVA as poor as women and as workers, no matter what caste, community or religion we belong to. Um, we organize to build our collective strength in our fight against poverty, to bring dignity and self-respect in the lives of our members, the women workers. Today, you will witness um, the life and work of SEVA's waste collector um, women members, um, some 45,000 of them who SEVA has organized. Her day begins at 3 a.m. in the morning when we all are all, you know, trying to rest and relax and get ready for um, rejuvenate ourselves for the next day's work, um, rummaging through the garbage dumps through the garbage bins and the waste that is strewn on the streets in our country. And yet, uh, she cleans the uh, waste, yet she's not even recognized as a worker. She cleans the environment, she helps mitigate the climate risks, and yet her contribution in environment mitigation and environment regeneration is not counted. SEVA organized these waste collectors into their cooperative, um, Gitanjali, um, and to create alternative opportunities which bring dignity and self-respect. Had it not been for Myra Bovinik, who was at the World Bank Institute, with whom we got an opportunity to share the struggle of these women workers, who then uh, readily put us in touch with WeConnect and Accenture, and I'm extremely grateful to the panelists, all of them today, Myra Bovinik, Elizabeth Waxes, Accenture, and Milan Vivier. We Connect and Accenture helped Kitanjali set up their own supply chain, bring in professional business planning skills, and um, bringing them ready, making them ready 
for the market. Uh, we are also extremely grateful to Milan Vivier, uh, who had, who played a very major role in connecting us to Walmart. And I think uh, it is because of this that Gitanjali is what it is today. It is these young waste collectors who are experiencing the uh, economic freedom. For Seva, this is bringing the informal sector women workers and their economic organization into the mainstream of the economy and into the market. This is formalizing of the informal sector workers' enterprises and enable them to scale. Thank you so much. Okay, so that was Rima Nanavati from Sewa. She was actually here a few months ago. Uh, we recorded a podcast with her. If you'd like to check that out, it's on our website, tgdev.org. You can also see a digital version of the brief of the report that you guys all have. We've handed out copies, uh, done by uh, my colleague, Myra Buvenic, with eminent help from others. And Myra, I'm going to invite you up now to give us a little bit of background and take us through some of the results and some of the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, let me just first... Well, let me tell you that it was really a privilege to uh, do this study. I mean, I've done many studies in my life, but this, I think, is quite unique. And it's because of the women that are behind it. Uh, before I start, uh, the study was done with Tanvi Jaluka. Tanvi, stand up. Tanvi. Uh, worked in the study with me and Megan O'Donnell, and unfortunately Megan is not here today, but you know, the, my great uh, partners in this venture. So this is, and I'm going to try to give you a bit of a background uh, to explain sort of how you go from being a waste picker to being a business owner. Uh, here is the waste picking in Ahmedabad. And here are some waste pickers. And here is a waste picker. And as you can see in the photos, a majority of waste pickers in India are women. In form of first, a majority of people in the non-agricultural sector in India are in informal jobs. 84% 84 of those uh, that work in the non-agricultural sector in India work in informal jobs. And there are more, a few more women than men. 85% are women, 83% are men. But women are twice the number of waste pickers in India. These women in Amenabad, as, you know, as a bad as waste picking is, they used to earn in a good month about an average of $25 a, a month. But then came the financial crisis. The, 20, the 2008 financial crisis did not only affect the formal sector, did not only affect businesses in the US and in the developed world, it really affected uh, everybody. And it led to a market crash of the waste picking business in India. The price of scrap dropped by almost half to 35%. Salaries of the waste pickers dropped by 43% to $14 average a month. Children were withdrawn from school. 77% of the families of waste pickers had to reduce their food consumption. 45% had to go out and get loans. So, and then adding insult to injury, the city decided to privatize some of the waste collection. So by privatizing some of the waste collection, the waste collection that the women used to do in the streets, they couldn't do any longer. So imagine the, these women had no options, right? So let's go sort of a bit more background and see what are the options for poor women in developing countries. How can we sort of upgrade or transform their enterprises? 
The first option, and I think and this is what Sewa does all the time, and it's the, perhaps the easiest option is organizing women workers in certain occupations for collective bargaining. And this is really what Sewa does all the time. And they organize waste pickers to get better conditions for their, for their jobs. They, you know, to talk to municipal inspectors and try to get them better, uh, a better environment of work. But, you know, when the market crashes for waste picking, this is not an option. What is the second option? The second option, and I think that this is the preferred, or up to recently, is the preferred option, is that really these women are in the informal sector, are waste pickers, but what they really want, and what the majority of very poor women want, is wage jobs. Jobs in the formal sector, right? Being employed. I mean, being an entrepreneur is not that easy, so, you know, and that is really what most economists think is the way to go, right? Just let's wait and see when countries start industrializing, and particularly in urban areas, you have the growth of manufacture, and you create you know, millions of jobs, and a lot of these jobs now are opening to women. This was thought to be the best option, you know, sort of the, the growth of, man, of weight jobs in manufacturing, but in fact, you know, and here, you know, you had the good stories of the early Bangladeshis, where, you know, women get jobs in manufacturing, and this leads households to realize that girls are valued, so they invest more in schooling, and there's this sort of virtue cycle. But, in fact, now we're seeing the other side of it. This is great if the jobs are good jobs, but if they're exploitative jobs, it can really, you know, lead to all the sort of the fires and the the dark side of the Bangladeshi story today. And there's a very interesting study that an economist, black man, just did in Ethiopia, and it's a randomized control trial, it's a very serious study, that shows, in fact, that if you give a sort of options to very poor women, enterprise options versus wage jobs, but you give them the options of enterprise with a capital infusion, a big capital infusion, training and technical assistance, and they do much better as entrepreneurs than in exploitative work in, in the wage sector. So that's the third option, right? And that is the option that said what took on, and it's basically form a collective social enterprise, Gitanjali. And here is Gitanjali now. Gitanjali started, you know, and the women organized, and they started doing various different products, paper-based products. But then, fortunately, and it was pure fortune, Gitanjali and Sewa went to a meeting with WeConnect. And I think that that was the amazing, the opening of opportunities for Gitanjali, and here it is a private sector collaboration. We connect instead, looked at Gitanjali, and turned over for, to Accenture. And Accenture came in and said, we are going to, with We Connect, we are going to open up markets for these Gitanjali women. So what does Gitanjali then, and the first thing that they did is they sort of instead, the women were doing a various different things. They were doing crafts and paper products, and Accenture said, no, you know, we are going to just do one production line of recycled paper products. Accenture and WeConnect provided technical assistance to the women. They provided training, and they will tell you much more what they're doing. And Accenture, in addition, provided financial support and provided a stipend to the women that is about around, it's around $40 a month or so. So 
the women started getting and started doing the production. Now, one very important thing, two very important things that I think are ex ex help explain the success of Gitanjali. One is that uh, we connect, certify them. And by certifying their businesses, they became, they formalized the cooperative and they became sort of more acceptable to start selling in, in the market, particularly the market for CSR. Second, the other thing that Accenture and WeConnect helped Gitanjali with, and Sewa, obviously, Sewa was behind it all the time, was they, they, they established a very stringent screening procedure for the women. So, for instance, in the beginning, and they, they did tests for the women, and they wanted the women to have leadership abilities and entrepreneurial ability and dexterity, because they had to work with paper products. In the first instance, out of 200 women who applied for jobs, only 10 got in. So they were very well screened. There was a certification process. And then there was a lot of training in, you know, on the job training, and the women started working in groups of women and in assembly line production, and then what they did have is they had a market, right? They had uh, Accenture opened a market with Staples, and Staples came in and took orders, and here you have the, the women. So then, and here they're doing different paper products, and uh, what also Accenture brought in, machinery. And these are big machines that the women use to cut the paper, to organize the paper. So, uh, and then we were asked to come in and do the case study of Gitanjali. What we did is we did interviews with key informants. We did a questionnaire, an in-depth questionnaire to eight of the women workers. There are about 50 women who work in Gitanjali, and we did an analysis of the business records that the enterprise has. It, what is, what sort of, what are our concluding, I think, uh, so, sort of assessment of how Gitanjali works, what is its social value and its economic value, and then, you know, I will turn it over. Gitanjali sort of has has resulted in an amazing social value for women. And the social value, I think, is based first on full employment. I mean, these women are fully employed, and they are economically self-reliant, and they're incredibly proud on being business owners. They're not workers, they're not employees. They're owners, and they, they, they will say that all the time. They earn, their earnings have increased dramatically. They are now between $38 to $60 a day. They, they have amazingly transformed their occupation. I mean, these were waste pickers, and you know, all the women we interviewed and all the, the questionnaires all had been waste pickers. They had been in informal sector, they had just gone out. Suddenly, they're in an assembly line working environment they work in the workplace, they don't work at home, and they have adapted themselves incredibly well. And I think that this is partly, partly because of the self-screening, but also a lot due to the training and the support that Accenture and WeConnect gave the women, and Sewa, clearly. So there, was, there, there is this amazing transformation for the women, and, and in the questionnaires, I mean, if you see the women and then the questionnaires, they all say, now we are dignified. Now we have a dignified job, and we can look at our families in other face. And we don't have to hide ourselves, because being waste picker is also, there's a stigma to it. They are dignified, they have full employment, and they have, very importantly, the social support in the workplace. 
there's also another very rigorous study of SEWA that showed that social support really increased, the social support of others in the group really increases these women abilities, self-reliance, and ability to increase their aspirations and to work well. So this amazing transformation, I think, is, is the result. And this is very important, I think, because there's a lot of talk about now, well, let's give just cash transfers to poor people, and they will, you know, they will transform their occupation. It's very clear to us, and, and we didn't do, obviously, a rigorous study, but it's very clear to us that the transfer of monies, the stipend that Accenture gave, gives us women, is very important. But it's only half or less than half of the picture. What it is incredibly important for these women is the, the, the notion that they are gainfully and productively employed, or that they're business owners. Particularly also, they're all very proud that they're able to work with, with machineries. And the, the, there's something about you know, them working with machineries that really increases their self-esteem and their aspiration. And you know, we just looked at the benefits for the women. But obviously, if the benefits are like this for the women, Imagine the benefits to the family. I mean, clearly, you know, if, if you were to look at the families of these, of these women, clearly they must be much better off today than they were when they were waste, waste pickers. Now, before I end, now what about the business bottom line? And that's where it, we had, we looked at records and Gitanjali wasn't keeping records until recently, so we were able to look at records for the last two years, for 2015 and 2016, or 14 and 15, anyway. <coughs> we, <have coughs> so we saw that in terms of <coughs> sales and gross income, Gitanjali in the last two years has improved dramatically. But still, they're not making a profit. <coughs> they're, still, they're still sort of, if you consider all the stipends uh, that Accenture gave them, they still are missing starting to really make a profit. So the question, I think, for the panel is what do we do? Why is it that they're still no, not making a profit? And you know, and Gitanjali is an exception, but I think on the other hand, you know, a lot of women enterprises in developing countries suffer same problems. How do we open up? How do we open up their opportunities so that they can really thrive and move the economies? Thank you. And oh, I didn't finish. Show. Here is the products. I can Sorry. do better than I can do better than that. Myra. Okay. I have them here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Myra. Uh -huh. um, I've actually got some of the products right here, which I'm going to <coughs> pass around. Uh, while I'm doing that, we're going to actually hear from someone who runs Gitanjali, Yamini Parekh. She was a waste picker herself, and now she runs the collective. It would be really great to get her perspective. So why don't we play that video? I'm going to pass these around. It'd be grateful if you can pass them back at the end <laughs> as well. Let's start with you. My name is Yamini Parikh. I have been working for 25 years. I work with the waste and recycle. I work with Sangathan. I work with the coordination of the cooperative. I work with the coordination of the तो गीतांजलि की शुरुआत तो 1995 से हुई है और 2008-9 में रसेशन आया तो यूरोप कंट्री का पूरा वेस्ट इंडिया में ठल आया और इंडिया में पूरा वेस्ट का जो रेट था वो 50 परसेंटेज कम हो गया जो बहन है रोज का 40-50 रुपया कमा देती है वो 35 रुपया कमाने लगी तो उसके पास उसकी संगठन था बहनों के पास संगठन था और उसकी एक कोऑपरेटिव भी थी तो कोऑपरेटिव और बहनों ने सोचा कि बहनों को क्यों ट्रेनिंग ना दे 
इसलिए गीतांजलि के थ्रू 700 करीबन 700 बहनों को ट्रेनिंग दी है स्टेशनरी आइटम बनाने जे, जे, जैसे कि फाइल फोल्डर रजिस्टर नोट पैड नोट ये सब बनाते हैं पेपर पेन वो सब बनाते हैं और उसमें से अभी 50 बहने ये मंडी में काम कर रही है जो बहने पहले 40-50 रुपया कमा दी थी अब अब वो महीने का छः हज़ार से सात हज़ार रुपया कमा सकती है जो हमने देखा है कि बहनों के हाथ में जो पैसा आता है आते हैं तो पहले अपने बच्चों का सोचते हैं तो अच्छी तरह से बच्चों को पढ़ा सकती है जो म्यूनसिपालिटी स्कूल में पढ़ते थे उसके प्राइवेट स्कूल में बच्चों को डाला है और जो दो टाइम वक्त खाना दो टाइम की रोटी भी बच्चों को खिला सकती है और बहनों अपनी खुद की मालिकी की जैसे कि गैस है तिचोरी है जो खुद की मालिकी का साधन भी इकट्ठा कर करती है अभी और गीतांजलि में जो एक आज़ादी तो बहनों को ये मिलती है कि एक आज़ादी तो मिली है दूसरी आज़ादी है वो आर्थिक आज़ादी तो हम हमने सोचा है बहनों को काम की दृश्यता मिले और बहनों को स्थायी रोजगारी मिले इसलिए गीतांजलि का मुख्य उद्देश्य है और जो बहनों गीतांजलि में काम कर रही है वही बहनों जो कागज चुनती है वही बहनों की एक भविष्य में हमें हमारा ऐसा सोच है कि वही बहनों की एक मिल हो और बहनों अपनी स्थायी रोजगारी कमा सके अभी जो 50 बहनें कमा रही है और उसमें हम बढ़ाने का सोच रहे हैं कि 5000 बहनों तक पहुंचे और ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा ऑर्डर मिले तो बहनों का समावेश हो सकता है कॉम्पेट हमारा मुख्य एम है कि बहनों ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा ऑर्डर हमको मिले और ज़्यादा बहनों को रोजगार Great. That was Yamini Parekh, the CEO of Gitanjali. Panelists, I'm going to invite you to take the stage right now. I will introduce you as you come up. Um, you've already met Maya Bhuvnich. Don't be shy. And we also welcome Milan Veer, who's the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Elizabeth Vasquez, the president and CEO and co-founder of We Connect International, which we heard about, the global network that connects women-owned businesses to global buyers. Uh, we welcome Nidra Dixon, Global Supplier Diversity and Sustainability Lead at Accenture, which, as we know, is a global professional service provider, uh, and Henrietta Kolb, uh, the head of the Gender Secretariat at the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group. Great to have such an eminent panel. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, I just want to start by picking up on one thing that Yamini said in, in the video there, and that was not only have women's earnings doubled, but their children now eat twice a day. That really struck a chord with me because it made me think, that's success. And I think that's also a reminder to everybody in this room, everybody watching, everybody who works in this sector and in our, in our world, that we have a responsibility to try and in, uh, extend that opportunity so many more people that really hit home with me when, when I heard her say that. So, panelists, um, uh, and maybe Elizabeth and Nidra, you could start with this, and then we'll get some views from all of you. Um, why was it that your organizations felt that this was the right cooperative to actually partner with and support? And then we'll start picking up on some of the questions that Myra raised about how do we extend this. So why don't we start there? So in the, in the beginning, and I have to say it is such an honor to be on this uh, panel with these amazing women who are such an inspiration, and so many of you who are friends who have been doing the work, this type of work, for a very long time. There are so many lessons to be learned. This was not an easy um, path, uh, but I was introduced by Amanda Ellis uh, to Rima at Sewa and Myra, and we had a conversation about some of the challenges with these women who were illiterate and numerate, and the only thing they and their mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers had ever done was waste picking, and all of a sudden it was privatized, and they had no options. And so Gift and Jolly was an informal group network of women business owners, SEWA members, um, that were passionate about um, recycled paper, uh, about working, uh, about being entrepreneurs, about feeding their families, um, and it just seemed like if we could just get organized um, and move them from the informal sector into the formal sector and have quality offerings that they could be very successful. But we didn't have a lot of resources. We had seed funding from the World Bank and we had a vision. All of us agreed that this needed to be done. 
We weren't sure what we were doing because there hadn't been anything exactly like this that would be private sector driven. So the assumption was we connect international, which is a nonprofit created by corporate buyers who want to buy from women in businesses. If these women were able to offer something with real value at the right, right price point and good quality that was safe, um, that the corporations would want to buy it. So we were so grateful to Accenture who jumped right in immediately because not only are they a market, they also have extensive experience in helping businesses grow and to understand what it means to be market ready. And so maybe Nidra uh, can share how you did that. Absolutely. Um, again, thank you guys for coming and it's an honor to be here as well. Um, a lot of the credit has to go to We Connect International because I think many people don't understand what a nonprofit goes through in trying to connect to a corporate and to understand. And so with Accenture, a lot of the things we do, if we're going to talk the talk, we have to walk the walk. And when we connect and Elizabeth came to us with this idea, it was like, this is great. We can actually put women who want to work to work, but you have to train them. You have, there has to be a start somewhere. And we found out that the plan was not to just throw money at it. The plan was to actually help develop women, actually help develop um, a plan. And something hopefully we'll talk about later is how to be sustainable in this. I think that could be the next step. But I think what's key in this was we have to be able to really help. And that's where the stipend comes in. Because if you look at one of the, the films that Accenture did with Siwa, a lot of this was unsafe. You know, women were getting their feet were being cut. They were being bitten by dogs. And you just start to think they were doing this. So they, there's a desire there. So we firmly believe that entrepreneurs are needed to build the social economic power. And if you build that, you build communities. So there you build communities. Now you're starting a process where the daughters can come in. Now you're building a future process. So it was a no-brainer for Accenture to step in, but I give so much of the credit to We Connect International for getting it started because I don't know how nonprofits do it. It is, <laughs> it is very difficult um, to approach any corporate. Um, so I, I definitely want to say thanks to We Connect for allowing us to even this opportunity to come in. Okay, great. And you know, you, some of the products are going around the room. Who currently has all the products? Great. Do you want to just stand up maybe and hold them up so others can see? <laughs> They're pretty awesome. I mean, hold up the, the notebook. I paid money for that. Pretty. Yes. Yeah. And that bag, just shake it out. Let's see the bag. Yeah. Look yeah, at that. That's, that's kind of awesome, great. isn't it? That's a gift. That's a gift <laughs> right there. Um, it's quality product. Um, they're behaving like a business, but what's holding them back? from you the greater success. And from this, we're going to generalize some lessons. Maybe Henrietta, Milan, you could uh, sure. give us some ideas here. Yeah. I mean, just to pick up a couple of things of what worked really well. And I mean, I've worked with all of you here on the panel in, in the past um, you know, sort of five to 10 years. And what I think is striking about this model that it ties in sort of four pillars that women entrepreneurs really need, I think, to help flourish. One is it ties in a very strong element around confidence building, right? And I think being one singular individual waste picking on their own and then being part of a larger collaborative effort, I think is huge in terms of the confidence and identity building. And I think that came out really beautifully in Myra's report. The second part, and I think that's where you guys came in um, really with very tangibly skills building. So not just any generic business skills, but very tailored combining personal leadership skills as well as business skills, right? And so the World Bank Group has done a lot of work that if you just put out generic business skills training, in particular, if you then want to supply it to larger corporates, it's not very useful and usually not that impactful. So I think that capacity, so it's confidence and the capacity, but in a very tailored manner. And then the third part is clearly the third C is the capital. And so there, I guess you had sort of a mix between grant infusion, right, from your more corporate social responsibility side, mixed with business capability building. And then obviously over time, obviously increased revenue streams have come actually from the sales part to it. So I think there's talking about sustainability, that's I think where the capital conversation is sort of has to go a little bit deeper. But then the fourth part, and I think that's almost the most important one, is the community. So confidence, capacity, capital, and community. And I think the community element is something that we hadn't maybe paid enough attention to. And so 
in particular in India, um, really interesting little study that um, the bank actually did around, for example, how training is more effective if you can bring a friend into the training, even though the friend is not necessarily running her business. But financial literacy training together with a friend has much more long-term impact than actually if you just go by itself. And we've seen it as we worked with Yale in South Africa and a couple of others that peer-to-peer -peer WhatsApp groups sometimes are much more effective than actual sort of more traditional mentoring models where you have a mentor who sort of knows it all and then you have the mentee as opposed to really crowdsourcing advice, not just about how to run your business, but how to cope with sexual harassment maybe at home, how do you cope with childcare and so on and so forth. So I think that sort of was like what was really phenomenal around this model, that it was holistic. And then if I, if I just might chip in just two more tangents that hadn't come out, maybe there was a side note in the report, but we find that that's very crucial is that SEVA stepped up to really provide two more things, which is child care support. And we know that all the women, in particular in India, obviously shoulder much more of the care responsibilities. So there was child care available, and I think that's crucial, and the private sector can come in to do a lot more around that, both for their formerly employed labor force, but also stretching that child care provision out into the communities to informal workers. And then an element that is crucial is insurance. So clearly, if you're obviously building up assets, which is what the cooperative has been doing, the piece of insurance is critical. And so I think looking at, and, and IFC has done quite a bit push on that, um, getting insurance companies to recognize that if you are actually insuring men and women, there are different needs and you need to design different products and services. And what you design for cooperative is very, very different in terms of insurance products and what you would design, obviously, for the retail market or women entrepreneurs who are in the SME ME level. Okay. I think uh, Henriette clearly laid out a number of the ingredients uh, that are critical to, uh, uh, to an enterprise like this succeeding. Uh, but I think we need to understand, on the one hand, um, how difficult this transformation is. Ma Myra used mm -hmm. the word transformation. If you can imagine, I mean, to me, it's almost varnished to call these women waste pickers in terms of what they do. Uh, I was there on a hot day uh, with burning uh, fumes in their faces, dirt, the lack of dignity, uh, the fact that these women had no other opportunity, uh, and this was how they were eking out an existence. I mean, you've got to put that in one place to understand just how difficult this transformation is, and it is indeed a transformation. The second major ingredient, in my mind, uh, is Sewa and what Sewa represents. Sewa is rather unique, uh, and for many, many years, several decades now, it has been deeply committed uh, to enabling women to be self-reliant, to move them from that kind of work, or even to improve that work, although personally I don't think any human being should be involved in that, that work in the way that, that, it, that it's done. Uh, but, but their commitment to full employment, uh, their commitment to uh, raising the dignity of the individual, they are also deeply committed to sustainable business. You cannot talk to the leaders of SEWA and, and have them not say, we're not interested in handouts. We're interested in creating viable enterprises that are sustainable. So there is a fundamental commitment and understanding of what is required for a business. And I think that is really essential to this having worked because it is conceivable that we connect and Accenture could have come into uh, a different partnership that may not be anywhere near what this one has proven to be, even though it's still a work in progress. Um, and then the elements that SEWA brings on, on their part uh, in terms of uh, whether it's insurance or they've got a bank, mm. uh, they enable the women to learn all of the principles that they need to learn uh, this process that they went through in determining who of those refuse pickers could be part of the new enterprise, uh, understanding their capacity, enhancing their capacity, and then realizing they couldn't do it alone. Uh, and I think that is fundamental to who they are and is a big part of this discussion, which is the role of the private sector, the role of other actors, in coming together to create a collaborative model that will ultimately 
create a sustainable business that will provide viable jobs with good incomes and enhance the dignity of the individuals involved in those jobs. So SEWA is an absolutely critical ingredient in this partnership, and it is rather unique uh, in that respect. And then the, the, um, the kinds of investments uh, that Accenture and WeConnect made to broaden that base for them so that they could actually do what they intended to do and hope to do. Okay. Um, you've all done a great job of characterizing the qualities of this project. And actually, Henrietta, you did a pretty good job of coming up with five C's, actually. <laughs> well, the insurance was an I. And I was kind of hoping that was going to be Sorry another C. That. Confidence, <laughs> capacity, capital, community, childcare, insurance. No. Uh, <laughs> I'd add to that connections, which you all bring. Um, but Milan, you talked about, and Sewa says this to you, they want to create a viable enterprise that uh, is sustainable. Is it sustainable? It's, they're still dependent on stipends. How do we get them over that so it stops being a charitable exercise and that it, it launches its own business? That's what I think we need to generalize mm -hmm. from this. So I'd like some ideas on that, please. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me just start, but I, I uh, know everybody wants to jump in on this. Uh, when you are there, uh, transpose yourselves into this small uh, building uh, where you've got a core group of women busy at work uh, with heavy machinery uh, and all kinds of uh, colors uh, that meet your eye and paper paperwork um, that uh, is being turned into uh, a number of, of different kinds of products. The other thing that hits you is the stamp on a lot of these products. Goldman Sachs, Cisco, Accenture. And you try to say to yourself, how in this little building, by all descriptions, can there be that connection to the global economy? And they are doing it, but they are doing it still at a very nascent level. And I think had it not been for Accenture bringing in Staples, uh, which is a major, major uh, client, they would not be where they are, even though this is still got a ways to go. So fundamentally, they've got to expand their market. Uh, they've got to expand it on several levels. The market within the Ahmedabad local community, and they have a local partner. Uh, they've got to expand it nationally. How do they sell within India and what that major market represents? And they've got other products, not just paper products, but another business uh, is called Rudy, which is, it involves herbs and other agriculture products that they're selling uh, in stores. And then how do they connect in that global economy where they are, uh, to some extent, already there? But the market is nascent. Uh, and some of the customers, the study will tell you, don't stay with them after that first buy or whatever influenced them to come in. So they've got to do a very uh, strategic, uh, considered, um, significant way at basically marketing who they are and growing that base of customers uh, and then there are all kinds of other issues in terms of the quality of their product, uh, the accounting that goes into it. Uh, but I think so much of this has to do with the base having been created and now how do you really uh, grow that market locally, nationally, and globally. And what is the role of people in this room, people in this sector, to help them do that? Well, I, I think from an Accenture standpoint, um, you know, and as a corporate, I'm going to start looking at that. I'm going to be like, okay, now we've provided the seed money, we've provided some skills, but what is that next phase? And I think that's what you look at is, are we ready for new skills? And maybe that's in sales and marketing, because I think that is really important to expand the other clients and to get that base in. So you just, it's, it's about... A continuing education, as I like to say. You're going to always continue to be a, a student if you're an entrepreneur. And as a corporation, we need to make sure that we're helping to continue to build the right skills. So I think that's one phase. I think the second phase, too, is to teach them how to grow and how to work with large corporations. And that in itself is a challenge. Accenture is over 400,000 people globally. And to try and get um, internally to understand 
that these products are available is I think is, a, is another challenge that was just stated. And I, I still go back and I say, well, why aren't we buying it again? And it could be because of the quality. So we need to look at how do we improve the quality. But do the corporations know they haven't bought it again? So it goes back to that sales and marketing, but having the right message and not, I think the other key is not waiting too long to start that next phase and not getting complacent with, okay, I've, I've given some money here. We've made some great products. We're good. No, you have to start planning those next phases as you're in that current phase. And I think that's going to be the, the key, but I think you've summed it up perfectly on the sales and marketing and the quality and bringing in more global clients. And I think that's where Accenture has to step up as the next level and that next phase is to provide the right training to help with the sales and marketing and to make sure that they're continuing to build quality pro products. And we had this discussion earlier. And maybe just to add to that, I think what, what you've hinted at is what Accenture is doing is to really look at your own procurement spend on women-owned and run businesses. And I think that's where the collective power of WeConnect is and, and the World Bank Group, and it's out in the open. We've done it now for the very first time um, to actually look at our procurement spend, which is about 1.6 billion per year, and to really understand how can we increase our spend on women-owned enterprise. And I mean, as everyone in this room, you know, have followed Walmart's um, efforts in this space, Exxon's efforts, and so on and so forth. It sounds easy, and it's really, really, really difficult. But I think that's where we need to make collective progress: is to steer the awareness as to from Absolutely. large companies and even smaller ones. I mean, you know, our client base of 2,000 clients around the world, having them understand who is in your tier one, tier two, tier three supply chains, and then kind of saying, okay, how can we build the capacity of women entrepreneurs who are already in the supply chain to help them grow and actually get to contracts with larger margins, but then also to build the supply chain, like obviously then to kind of enter and, and, and get women more, more involved in that. And Elizabeth, I mean, has revolutionized the world, I think, with kind of getting people to pay attention to this topic. Um, I think if it wasn't for WeConnect, uh, and then obviously you, I think, 80 companies, right, that are already part of that, I think we wouldn't have actually had that Absolutely. conversation. So if we just take it for a moment out of like India in that particular context, that's I think where everyone can really um, move, move the needle on it. Um, but obviously there's another part to it, which is the capital injection. And so IFC is just starting to, to experiment a little bit more around short-term trade financing and not just short-term trade financing for suppliers based off on large invoices that they have from their buyers, but to just also determine the pricing based on environmental, social, Another new frontier will be actual gender compliance of those suppliers. So there's ideas around incentivizing and injecting capital at the same time that I think we could all look into you know, expanding and doing a lot more of. So that's something that we're hoping to expand in particular in the next um, five years to really incentivize suppliers to look for environmental, social, and for gender dimensions. You know, it's interesting uh, in this configuration of the private sector uh, and SEWA, that the government has not been involved. Usually you've got the three legs of the stools mm -hmm. where the public sector has a, a critical role to play vis-a-vis -vis government at whatever level. You've got the private sector and you've got civil society represented in, this, in the SEWA model. Uh, but going to Henriette's point about procurement, there's tremendous capacity in government to procure from businesses like this business, mm -hmm. uh, and that hasn't been tapped. Um, government plays a strategic role in many of these kinds of enterprise developments, either through deregulation or incentives of one kind or another. Here it's being done, even though India prides itself as being one of those great engines of growth in the world with China and this competition that's going on, uh, where I think a lot more can be done in this space, particularly since Sewa's reputation is so extraordinary in that country. Uh, respected uh, in all categories. And in terms of the sustainability um, challenges, I, I want to be very transparent that there was nothing easy about this. Mm -mm. <laughs> there were huge lessons learned. It has taken much longer than I, I thought it would take for them to be at a point now where, yes, the, the numbers show that they're not hugely profitable, but you have to remember they're choosing not to have a profit margin because they're paying their people more. 
So the owners of the business are choosing to pay themselves more, which of course is gonna bring down the profit margin. So that's a, that's a conscious decision that they're making. And then the challenge of, yes, you have almost all of the women involved in this were both illiterate, unnumerate, and hadn't had any experience working with the private sector um, or some of the, the machinery that we're talking about. So it has taken this long to have everyone feel comfortable with processes and mechanization and organizing in a way that is within the legal framework that the government has set up for legal entities. And they've done a brilliant job, and it is all due to Sewa. They did all the hard work. The members of Gitanjali are the ones who did all the work. We were there to get to be a part of it, but they did all the hard work. Um, and I would say that you know, there were a number of issues that will challenge us for scale. So we wanted, in, in the beginning, uh, we saw what they were doing. We were taking pictures. We were writing short reports. We were shopping it around to other corporations that we work with. And they were mortified because we didn't notice, because we've been on the ground and we know what it's like to do this kind of work, next to the women were the children. And we're just like, oh, child labor. <laughs> well, yes, get it don't want child labor. These kids are learning a craft, and it wasn't necessarily during school hours, but by the way, none of these kids had ever gone to school. Mm -hmm. So when we actually went to visit the women of Sewa, they were all telling me, it's so, they're so happy to be there, sorry their kids couldn't meet me and us because they're in school for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. So the kids really were in school, but we did have to identify opportunities yeah. to create a crash, the Sewa mm -hmm. did, uh, to make sure that there was a safe place for them to be not on the factory floor. But there are just so many realities for women in, in these situations that a lot of us just can't even begin to anticipate all the different challenges, but also opportunities, huge opportunities. So now is the question of scale. How do we all, not just the people on this panel, but like all of us work together to help the world understand its purchasing power? As individuals, as families, as communities, as businesses, as multilaterals, uh, as governments, um, of the huge impact we can have. We all have to buy notebooks. We all take notes in all the meetings we go to. What does it matter if it's a notebook that we get at the staples that we usually get, or one that happens to have a transformative effect on people's lives? But it's not in our consciousness. It's not that we're against buying from the women of Sewa. It just hasn't occurred to us to go out of our way to ask Staples, do you have any products made by women? And by the way, do you have anything from this organization called Sewa or the Gitanjali um, uh, group? So I, I think that that issue of uh, consciousness linked to action, taking simple, simple steps and every day, thinking about all the things that we buy and how much of it is with the, these communities that we care about. But that's the critical piece of it. But how do you, the disconnect between the women at the, the very base and the largest companies in the world. It's, it's like close to impossible. It's being done, but it's close to impossible. So you have to look at a true value chain approach. Where along the entire value chain are there real economic opportunities yeah. for these women to make contributions and to benefit from the value chain um, and not constantly just be impacted by it, but actually transform markets and create markets. So I'm very, very optimistic, but I, I'm also, because you know, we were there from the very beginning, we know that this is not something that will happen overnight, but we also now know that it's possible. And how do you get the women who have historically been a part of this base of the pyramid, illiterate and numerate, to also be sales and marketing people who can knock on the door of the government of India or other corporations? So finding a hybrid of how do you bring in a mostly internal talent, but some external talent who can serve as translators, who understand those different um, spaces and can make that happen. And I think, Myra, you just, what CGD has done to help capture the reality of how hard this work is, but how critical it is to be done and to be done right. And to, for all of us to share what we're learning when we make mistakes, what's not working, we have to have these very honest conversations. Actually, you know, I think it's good that government was not involved <laughs> <laughs> at the first, because I think that that what Gitanjali has, and particularly, you know, with Sewa and WeConnect and Accenture, it got off the right foot. It got off having a market, establishing a market. So, because I've seen, I've seen many others 
sort of micro enterprises, women businesses, sort of with good intentions of government. They set up these things. They don't even, you know, they don't even sell any. I mean, they're sort of very welfare oriented. And I think that it was very good and I think it's very healthy that Sewa has this very business mentality and that they got interacting with uh, Accenture and we connect. I mean, that's, that I think is the beginning of success. What they need now, and you know, reviewing the literature and the new evidence that it com is coming up, more and more the evidence is saying that you can transform occupations of these very mm -hmm. poor people, of these very poor women. But that really what you do need is upfront investments, significant upfront investments. And I think ca a significant capital infusion probably is what will make the difference with Pita and Jali right now. And the question there is, you know, I think access to financial resources is one of the main constraints that women's businesses have at all different levels. You know, and here in the very bottom, obviously, there are additional constraints. But I think that starting to change that will really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Henriette, what's the role for your organization, the IFC, sure. in exactly what Maya was talking about? And maybe you could also talk about the potential for the WeFi initiative. How sure. did that help? Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think, I mean, there's a role to play, I think, sort of, you know, to not, in what my writer said, to not bottleneck women only mm. just at the micro level, right? Because we know women have full asset yeah. class up to the VC level. And funding that goes to women-owned enterprises is dismal on all levels. So um, on the IFC side, I think there's a couple of things we are already doing and where we will be doing some, some more work. One is what I've just mentioned, which is short-term trade financing, right? And incentivizing, working with staples and others to actually then really making sure we get more women entrepreneurs into their supply chain and incentivizing that by by providing uh, supply chain financing so that's one thing i think that we will continue under wefi but as i mentioned just briefly with a much more stronger gender lens focus on that so to incentivize actually um, buyers to pay more attention to that as well right and so the second piece is obviously ifc has been a huge investor in the microfinance space and we continue to do that but i think what we often see, obviously, once microfinance um, you know, institutions or NGOs get sort of commercial, we actually lose female borrowers. And so to pay much more attention to actually see, you know, once the commercializations happen, what is the borrower profile? And Women's World Banking has done some terrific work around that. So working with them, and they are exploring a new fund, actually, that we are also um, looking at. So really thinking about how can we not just, you know, basically repeat some of the challenges that the microfinance industry has faced, but really kind of help to design products and solutions that microfinance institutions can offer, including insurance, and really have a holistic suite of financial products, and not just go, okay, savings or only credit, but look at the entire suite of financial products, including housing finance, because we know that a lot of women entrepreneurs run their business from their homes. So if you don't really look beyond just credit, and I think IFC has done a terrific job on credit, but I think we want to stretch ourselves, and that's where our commitment is with WeFi, to go into areas that are much, much, much harder. So now pension funds want to become much more socially responsible in their investments. What does that mean? What does gender lens investing mean? So getting some much better data points into that conversation is, I think, the first step, because all data comes just out of the US and the UK when you look at um, gender lens investing and the indices. So looking at what does that mean in emerging markets, and then looking at how can we extrapolate out from agricultural financing where we've done risk sharing facilities and so on because most of cooperative financing is in the agriculture space, right? And so it's very different because market access is very different. So you have to just sort of understand what are the models that are working there and we've done a ton of work in Ethiopia on risk sharing facilities that help 70 cooperatives. But if you dig into cooperative structure and leadership, it's not women who run most of these cooperatives. So you need to reform sort of that piece as well. But then look at what are the financing models that might work for Aceva, which is incredibly unique. And so I don't think it's sort of one size fits all. When you come to the capital piece, we have to be incredibly nuanced and look across all asset classes. You well, sorry, just one second. Mm. You, you mentioned, Henry, that a new fund that you're looking at. Is that the WeFi initiative or is there something so, different that we don't know about that you're about to reveal to us? Right, no, no, no. <laughs> um, 
Maybe just for people who are not fully aware, just a quick word on WeFi, because we all throw out way too many acronyms. Um, <laughs> so it's just Women Entrepreneurship Finance Initiative. This is the Ivanka Fund. Well, well, it's not being referred to as. I know, I know, I, but just as we all know that, that reference. I just want to spend a minute to explain what it is. So it's about 14 countries that are putting in some money, um, about 340 million, that is then being onward invested into women-owned enterprise. It's specifically focused on SMEs, less so on a microspectrum. And so the fund is very much set up It's a grant-based fund to provide, and that's where the private sector, I think, has a huge role to play, because some of the cooperatives are very risky, right, to invest. That's why the private sector does not onward lend to cooperatives, is to de-risk some of that. So grant funding will be used for blended finance, and then some of the money will be used for advisory services. Because what we've seen is that you cannot actually succeed so easily if you just put in capital. The combination of capital and capacity support, both for our clients and for the end beneficiaries, it's what's changing and kind of helping to achieve more sustainable business practices. Otherwise, capital is spent, life goes on, right? Um, so I think that combination is very useful. So WeFi is trying to do that. Um, it's trying to do that through various multilateral development banks in very close partnership with others. So we're hoping and partnering with um, Reconnect International and various others who are interested in partnering with IFC and others who are putting forward proposals. So that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, I think we should look at life within WeFi and life outside WeFi, because I think there's a lot more, obviously, that's happening and is already in motion, um, so we shouldn't just restrict ourselves to that. But I no, think the fund, just very quickly, the fund that, that you asked me about, Women's World Banking, um, obviously most of you, hopefully, are in this room are very aware about um, their terrific work, um, and so Mary Ellen Iskandarian has set out a new strategy for the organization, and one of them is to uh, launch a second fund that invests in um, companies that have gender diverse commitments. And so that's the fund that I think hopefully all of you um, might also who come from the private sector be given some attention to. And I think uh, what uh, Henriette has just described is, is the exciting space now in access to capital uh, that is looking at a multidimensional model uh, to ensure that businesses can, these viable businesses can indeed become, nascent businesses can become viable. But I think it is really important to um, uh, to reiterate what Elizabeth said, is there is going to be this need for an infusion of capital uh, for this enterprise. And if it is successful in growing its market, is it going to have the capacity in growing that market uh, to scale in terms of its productivity? It's going to need additional machinery. It's, it's going to have capital costs that are going to have to be met somehow. So I think that has to be a big part of the consideration. There was discussion about how you do that marketing better. Is it come from the outside? Does it come from the inside? Um, and I think, again, a trait of SEWAS that is not to be underestimated is their commitment to training. Uh, they even charge, in the number of their training programs, a minimal amount, let's say a nickel, uh, in terms of our currency, but so that the women would understand that this training has value. Because if you just give things away, the, the uh, appreciation of it isn't what it can be. So I think the fact that they have an academy, that they're committed to training, that some of that can occur internally as well as the external supports. Um, so I think that whole training piece has to be factored into this uh, because it's made such a difference so far. And then just to get back to my, what Myra said about government, maybe it is the case that in this a situation, it's just as well that the Indian government wasn't involved. But I don't want your statement to be more broadly interpreted that they're always a problem, because had it not been uh, for government's partnership in a lot of these kinds of enterprise development situations, uh, they probably wouldn't have gotten off the ground. But it's been the partnership that's made it rich, and the fact that each partner has brought uh, particularly important ingredients. Okay, one last, uh, Nidra, come on. Yeah, I, I think just to add on the capacity building, I think um, what Accenture is doing for the next step in India is we have what we call our mentoring program. We're running it currently in four geographies. And to begin to run this in India will, again, not only help, well, there's money that we've done, right, and that we'll continue to do because um, that is a commitment, but how do we help and, and learn and teach them the capacity building? So in this training that we do, we take the women-owned businesses, and, and we'll work with CWA on this, and 
we partner them with Accenture mentors that will come in and have a set curriculum that will help them with the marketing, help them with um, gaining access to capital, how to hire and retain the top talent. So that might be helping them, you know, gain those profit margins and maybe taking a little from to show them and teach them balance. But it's important to do not only have the capital, but we need to also help them to build capacity and how to maintain that and what's the next step. Mm -hmm. So that's our next phase in India is to do what we call our DSDP, another acronym, mm -hmm. and that's Diverse Supplier Development Program. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. One last question from me to which um, I invite brief responses, and then I'm going to open it up to everybody else. Um, we've talked a lot about what made Gitanjali a success, what it needs to be in business, more of a success, but the fact is it's still an exception. It employs just 50 women. Um, there are millions more women who are employed in wage labor in the informal sector uh, in Asia and throughout the developing world. So to what extent do you think you know, this is actually a viable uh, opportunity to empower women economically and socially through social, their own social enterprises? Well, I think we have to do both. Uh, and I think wage labor is critically important. It employs large numbers of people. Uh, and we have to constantly work at it, whether it's the factories uh, in South Asia uh, or whether it's in agriculture uh, and across the board. But there's something about entrepreneurship that we know from all of the data uh, in terms of what it does to economies, uh, what impact it has, not just on the individual, but on GDP in terms of creating growth, enabling higher incomes, uh, and creating jobs. I mean, it is the engine in so many economies, small and medium-sized businesses. That's what we're talking about. And the work that this case study represents, and I salute everybody who's been involved in it, is to show what is required uh, from this example uh, and how we can grow that, how we can make these kinds of enterprises more successful, because they matter greatly. Yeah, I think we can't let the private sector off the hook or framing it positively. I think we have to involve the private sector a lot more uh, in conversations around how do we close gaps, both for women and men at the leadership, at the workforce, at the supply chain, the consumer, and the community. And I think we can only achieve progress. And we've seen the West put out, no, the first time in 11 years, we're going backwards. I mean, it's marginal, but it seems to be going backwards for gender equality. So if we don't get the private sector to step up and provide some of these um, commitments, and get the competitive spirit into that, I think we're probably shortchanging ourselves. And we're leaving value on the table for the families, for clearly the companies, but also for society at large. And the IMF has done some incredible work on the macro side. And I think I see we want to be doing more and more, at least at the firm level, because at the firm level, both in terms of the informal workers and the, form level, uh, the formal employment, I think we can transform markets. Last point on that, I think we have just become um, edge gender assessed. And that's something we are asking our clients to increasingly get involved in, really closing gender gaps at the workforce level. And so that's an international certification. I don't understand why we have, you know, it's 180 companies who have done it. We should have thousands and millions of companies who just do it and that buyers ask their suppliers to just be certified. All so I think, them. yeah. So I think we really have opportunities because now we have the tools. And with obviously the knowledge that um, you know, CGD brings into that space, the evidence, we can't sit back and say we don't have enough data to act. We have enough data to move forward. Okay. Well, I think that we've got to go back to educating. How many people actually know that this is being done? Mm. Um, I, so many papers, this is fantastic, has come across our desk, but we haven't been able to read them all. We haven't been able to. So I think we also need to find out what's a better way of communicating the success mm -hmm. of this to actually get to more. So I think that will be the, the main point is that we've got to be able to share the success because once you share the success, someone else is going to want to come in. And, and I take that as Accenture has to start that. I need to tell everyone this is what we've been doing. This is so much more to be done. So we need to continue to educate others and share those success stories because if you keep them held close to the chest, then no one's gonna read the great work that Myra's done on this, on this study. So it's, we need to share this study. We need to continue to talk about this study. So it's not just putting more capital into it, which we have to, but you have to, sh um, to share the success of this to keep it going and to grow. Elizabeth, Myra, quick point. 
Yeah, so I, I would agree, and I, I really don't see it as an either or. I, I think you have to focus on employment because not everyone can or should be an entrepreneur. Um, and you have to have entrepreneurs who create jobs. And there's so many women-owned businesses in this world who have huge potential um, to grow their companies, deliver innovation, and to create desperately needed jobs in every country that they just they need access to markets. They need an equal opportunity to compete and to win business. And they're generally they're not looking for grants anyway. They want to sell their stuff. They're entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So I think the potential, and when we talked with uh, Shamrook and I were just in um, Dhaka meeting with women and businesses, and if you ask them, you know, would you like a $100,000 loan that you have to pay back or 100000 in equity? By the way, there is, are no equity, hardly at all investors, but you give up some of your company. Or would you like a $100,000 uh, sale that you keep and you decide how to invest in your company? They all want sales, but eventually, they need investments. And so if they have sales, if they have customers, if they have purchase orders, they can actually go to the banks. And in fact, the banks will come to them because they see it as a, a profit opportunity. So I just think we have to think a little bit differently about this, the, of the economic imperative of all of these things coming together in a more strategic way and, and not assuming what the potential of these women is, but just giving them a fair, equal opportunity to do what it is they're passionate about and what they're good at. I agree completely and we need both. <laughs> what they say. <laughs> the one thing that, that I thought was very interesting about this case study, and I think that I've seen it now in other evidence, is that particularly in very traditional societies, bringing women out of the house into the workplace really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So it, it, the, there is an incredible advantage of taking the women, particularly you know, in very conservative households, to a workplace that is gender friendly, particularly if they're working with other women. And that, that does seem to increase uh, the self-confidence and self-reliance of women. OK, great. Um, I'm going to open up to questions. Sorry, I haven't left you as much time as I hoped. Uh, we have a, a microphone going around. Uh, Daniel has a microphone, great. Um, if I come to you, I'm going to ask you just to say your name, your affiliation, and then a brief utterance that ends in a question mark, please. Um, <laughs> let's start from back. That lady, then this lady, and then this lady, and I think we might just be out by then. Time. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Sia Novroji. I work with the 3D program for girls and women, which is seeking to bring together um, three sectors, the private sector, government, and civil society to advance uh, gender equality and girls and women's empowerment. We work in Pune City in Maharashtra in India, and our key partners there in the city are KKPKP, which is a waste pickers trade union, and Swatch, which is their associated cooperative. And just to let you know about sort of a different approach, in Pune, waste is big business still. There's a lot of money to be made, and the approach that KKPKP and Swatch have taken is to try and protect women's interests in that big business as it's being transformed. Um, and dignity is a huge part of that. And one of the things that they did early on... Yeah, no, I'm going to ask you, is this actually going to be a question? Yes, it is. Could we move it to the question? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Just for um, the sake of time. One of, one of the things they did was calculate the women's contribution financially to municipal services once an agreement was made with the municipality, but also the environmental benefit. And I was just wondering, um, and, and both were, were pretty significant and have done a lot to raise the profile of women's work in this sector and their own dignity and self-worth. It's been a pretty clear translation. Um, so I didn't hear anything about the sort of environmental benefits of this endeavor and whether that's been pushed in the marketing or, or whether you're planning to do that. And a, a second quick question is, whether the Indian um, CSR mandate, the 2% mandate, is being sort of tapped either in terms of providing technical assistance, funding those stipends, or other, in other ways. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. And then two more quick questions. Hi, my name's Beth Hand. I bow down to you wonderful women. Um, we were just at the largest tech trade show on the planet. And one of the things that we actually did a report afterwards, what we saw was a missed opportunity by the corporations to focus on being a good global citizen. So if I saw, and I don't know what efforts, that's when I'm curious about what efforts are you seeing where organizations, like if Staples, if I walk through Staples and I see something and it shows me this really cool bag with this print and I see a little bit of that story, 
That's a trillion dollar market that it, and it influences. People want to buy in Western companies or cultures, we want to buy things where we know that it has meaning and that our organizations are making meaningful choices of what they're selling to us. So I'm really curious what you've seen. Uh, we did a report on this. We sent it to the association. They've been very appreciative of it, but it's it's a missed opportunity and it falls keeps falling into this bucket of CSR. It's just freaking good business, you know? <laughs> So I, I'd just love to see more of that happening. Love to see what you've seen. I think Thank that's you. the motto for the event, isn't it? Just freaking good business. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you had a question, David. Hi, good morning. My name is Ruta Adis, and I'm from ACG Inc. And I'm a women's entrepreneurship advocate researcher. And I I'm really enjoy that you presented this specific case today and the focus on the business development side. Um, I've been looking at venture capital. And I mean, there are a lot of actually commonalities in the sense that you need a cap huge capital infusion, you know, women aren't getting the percentages mm -hmm. they should be getting, uh, huge capital infusion, the mentoring and support and the pivoting that may be needed to get the right product to the right, you know, um, sources. But my question is, how long does it take? And I know you've just started, but same with venture capital, it can take 10 years, more than 10 years, and lots of different capital infusions along the way. But this could be an excellent case study for investors, they know what they're, you know, what what's involved. Gender lens investing, what's involved. I'd like to just hear your estimates. How long do you think it will take? You know, how long have you been underway, and how long will it take? Thanks. Okay, great. Three different and good questions there. Uh, panel, I'm going to throw them open to you. I'll just recap the questions very quickly. Uh, from uh, was it Sienna? Sienna. Uh, Sienna. Um, two questions actually. You know, uh, the environmental benefits of uh, the waste because work being pushed. And are you tapping into, or is Gitanjali and others tapping into the Indian government's 2% CSR mandate? Uh, from Beth, um, what efforts have you seen from corporations to actually promote uh, women-owned enterprise products? And then from Ruta, how long is it going to take to get the capital to women-owned businesses that they need? So pick and choose as you will. On the environmental benefits, definitely. I mean, they're, they're using that, that argument for the marketing purposes, yeah. Most of them have not tapped the 2%, right. I, I don't think effectively, within um, the, the cooperative itself. Um, but I think that has huge potential once they have the ability, the right people, to be able to knock on those doors and explain the connection between the 2% and what they're doing. Uh, so I think that's the next step, and it perfectly describes what we all feel is the next one of the next phases. Um, but linking it to the CSR, I think it has to be based not on the 2% mandate, but because it's good freaking good business. Um, because the corporations that are members of We Connect International, there aren't government mandates that are making them do this outside of the United States. South Africa has some encouragement, but it's not global, and yet they're doing this. And, and I can promise you these companies want to be the most profitable companies and are trying to anticipate the needs of their market um, and finding the best innovations, the best total value at the best price, it happens to have awesome social benefits, CSR benefits. And I think if we can look at development that way, at least as it relates to women entrepreneurs, I feel like we'll be a lot more successful. But part of it is a mindset change, not just in the corporate minds or the government minds, um, but in the women's minds themselves and the people in the development community who may not necessarily understand markets and the market value of what's being done with initiatives like this. So I think there's a lot of transformation that has to happen in our minds, and then we can take it into action. Um, and there wasn't a lot of VC investing happening at that, that, um, at that level, but I think uh, um, the, the lessons learned from that um, in uh, more inclusive investments for inclusive development I think are huge. And, and I'll take on the, the logo now and, um, of women-owned products, so in the U.S., mm. Um, we bank, um, Women Business Enterprise National Council, and also um, working with WeConnect, there is a logo, and Walmart has come out to where there are products that you can buy, and it has a logo, and you know that that product is developed and owned by a woman-owned business. I think so starting out, and I think it will be great, and when that time will happen, um, but you do see other things that you let them know it's a, a woman-owned product, maybe not so much in the tech sector, but hopefully it, it will get there. Um, but it is definitely something I think that's a very good observation that you had. Um, but it will start to take off with other logos to understand that they're women-owned products. Henrietta, what about talking about that question about capital? Yeah, so I, I guess like I sort of, you know, want to actually comment more on the corporations announcing that they're buying from women-owned enterprise, because I think that shifts some of the capital. 
uh, infusion. And so I think on that front, we have seen in emerging markets in particular very little um, to actually put out sort of in their stores, this is women owned. And if at all, it is very much focused on arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of reinforces um, occupational stereotypes. So I think we have to be also careful if we do handicraft and so on, and then just label this as woman owned as opposed to you know, many, many other businesses that women are involved in, running logistics companies and so on and so forth. So I think if we do it, we should do it across the board and across Absolutely. sectors, and in particular in male-dominated sectors, to kind of counter some of this women equals micro equals handicraft equals you know, low end. Uh, and I think that's kind of something that I would be um, cautious yeah. Like an engineering firm or something yeah. like yeah. that. That yeah. would be great. Yeah. Milan. So just uh, very quickly on the environmental question, this has been basic to SEWA from the get-go yeah. in organizing uh, the waste pickers to, to describe uh, in very clear-cut ways just what value uh, their participation was rendering. But I think it's as important in terms of this business that we're describing because it's recycled mm -hmm. um, the paper uh, and there are a number of products that they've produced at the request of their customers that actually have an environmental theme. And I think you're exactly right. To build on that theme is certainly important for our world today, but also an incentive for the business. Um, secondly, on the frickin' good practice, I couldn't <laughs> agree with you more. I just feel this is my life. Win-win. Uh, it's a win for everybody. Uh, and there is now some early data that's come in that shows, to Nidra's point, that where you advertise on the shelves of the businesses that this is women owned, you get that much more interest in the product and purchase of the product. Uh, so I think there's a lot we can learn in this space in terms of how to market um, uh, products, services that are produced um, by business. And in terms of how long it's going to take, uh, it's going to be at the, at the rate we're going on terms of women's equality, it will take another hundred years for parity. But I think if we all came together, no matter where we sit, and figure out how to aggregate in a much more compelling, successful way, we can get there a heck of a lot faster. Okay. We're half the population. <laughs> And we have these amazing men who That's also right. care He's about inclusive machines. growth. So it's like <laughs> we just have to decide. Yeah. Uh, one very quick question on Twitter. Just want to squeeze this in for Myra for you. 30 seconds uh, from Samantha on Twitter. Do we need to fully succeed in this program before this same model can be applied across the country and hopefully globe? I think I know your answer. but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> I know. No, you were not expecting. I don't think so. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> okay. Look, we're out of time. On that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, thank you for the oh questions on Twitter, for watching on the live stream. I'm going to invite you to thank our awesome panel this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Very